Hi, I'm Asher Miller. I'm Jason Bradford. And I'm Rob Dietz. Welcome to Crazy Town, where Mad Max looks like a documentary. The topic of today's episode is the Maximum Power Principle. And please stay tuned for an interview with our very own Richard Heinberg. Share, Jason, it's that time of year where I like to hit the Oregon coast. What oh, about you guys? It's so warm over there. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't go that far, but you know, the, the ocean's speaking. nice. The be- yeah. I mean, beautiful beaches. It's just beautiful. beautiful. It's beautiful. I want to find pirate ships out there. This is not the Goonies oh. movie, okay? As much as... You that, got my reference. Yeah, well, that should usually be my special little contribution to this podcast. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I bring it up because I was thinking maybe the three of us could get out there there for a little R and R, a little vacation once oh, we yeah. put the microphones down. A little yeah. crazy challenge. Can we retreat? wait until I get my second shot? Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm actually uh, scheduled as well. So I uh, bring this up because I also want to have a competition with you guys. Classic, you of course know? you do. Yeah. I like to play games you when do. you go to the beach. You know, it's all that sand. You could play frisbee. You could play with the dog. But no, I want to play. Who can dig the biggest hole in an hour? <laughs> okay. <laughs> And what I what I want to play with this game, I'm going to let each of us bring uh, some some item, some How artifact. How old are we, by the way? I don't know. I, I like to I like to be like a 12 year old when I go to the beach. 12, ride like the six. ride the waves okay. and right. he does. He okay, we'll castles. dig holes, man. If that's what you want. to Yeah. Do. So I, I want to invite you each to to bring a tool, and we'll see who can dig the biggest hole. Jason, what what are you going to bring? Well, I've got a lot of shovels to choose from. Um, and a couple of them I'm pretty good at using. So I'm just going to use a nice, sturdy shovel. Well, I, you are a farmer who puts in a lot of work in the field. Oh, yeah. So I've got, I've got I, muscles building I'm, back now, I'm a so. little scared of how, yes. how much you can dig. How about you, Asher? What are you going to bring? Well, I can bring anything I want. Yeah. Okay, fine. How about a John Deere 410K backhoe? Oh, fuck. Oh. <laughs> a backhoe, baby. Oh, uh, well, that's geez. pretty good. I, I, think, mean, I think you... you if, I'm gonna if kick I kick the shit out of you oh, with that shovel, I don't know if I'm going to show up anymore. Vegas is kind of far from the Oregon coast, but if I'm going there, I might lay a bet on you <laughs> having a bigger hole at the end of an hour than Jason has. Yeah. And we're ignoring, you know, any restrictions, license issues, yeah, yeah, permits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. yeah that's well, different. it doesn't matter anyway because I'm going to bring a Bagger 293 bucket wheel excavator. Oh, that sounds like it's <laughs> even bigger. <laughs> yeah, what is that? <laughs> so. Uh, it's the biggest mining machine ever created on the face of the planet. <laughs> How are you going to get it there, buddy? Hey, uh, details, okay. all right? Let's not... Let's not uh, Logistics. How yeah, let's big not are we delve. talking about? I thought I was going big. You're well, big. Well, okay. Let, we, we put together... I, I grabbed a table with some stats on it with, with some horsepower and kind of sand uh, amounts we can expect to move in an hour and, and how big these things are. So let, let's do a little comparison. I'm in it. last place. So, <laughs> Jason, uh, how much does your shovel weigh? Oh, uh, yeah, five ten pounds. Okay, uh, how about how about your backhoe, a share? Eight tons, baby. Eight tons. <laughs> well, my uh, my bagger two ninety three weighs fourteen thousand two hundred tons. <laughs> <laughs> are you sure it'll fit on the beach? Uh, Which might. beach are we going to? Yeah, I know. Well, okay. it's not going to be there for long after I start digging. Horsepower, Jason, we, we kind of talked about this. Yeah. You basically, we think a trained athlete can generate about 0.35 horsepower over an hour. I'll be like, I'll be like 0.25 maybe. Oh, I was going to say like, like 0.8. Dude, oh. you know, you're, dude you're plays way tennis like all the time. Athlete. Yeah. yeah. But I could, I, I, for an hour, I could probably work at a quarter horsepower, I'd say. <laughs> Pretty solid. Yeah. Uh, and, maybe and, a third. And a share of your backhoe? Uh, about 106 horsepower. So, so Jason, you're you're at one person over that hour a share. Yeah. That's the equivalent of about what uh, over a thousand over people. a thousand people. Yeah, yeah. and my uh, <laughs> my bagger two ninety three has twenty over twenty two thousand horsepower. So I'm I'm at over two hundred twenty two thousand people. <laughs> nice. nice. Again, I don't think we can fit that many people on the beach, and I'm yeah. of course worried about you know. The three foot rule and all that, yeah. you know, COVID. Stuff. Hard to do these days. This Asia. is incredible. So the if we're the, in Florida, we're clear. So let me run through this a little bit. Like the excavation 
we think Jason could get about 12 cubic feet cleared out. So that's like, what, digging a grave, basically, yeah, or something sure. like that. And, You're working hard, baby. You know, a yeah. share, I, I doubt, you know, who knows? Maybe in the sand. It's not as hard to dig as soil. He's digging but, his own grave. Yeah. But, uh, a share, you could get about 3,600 cubic feet, and I can get about 500,000 cubic feet. <laughs> <laughs> of yeah. course, weight wise, you know, we already said mine's 14,000 tons. So, fuel usage, Jason, what, you need like a bologna sandwich or yeah, something? Yeah, basically, <laughs> I'm going to use about probably up about 300 kilocalories or something like that an hour burning through that baby. So, and a, yeah. And a share over the course of an hour? What are, about two gallons of diesel. Yeah. You might also eat a bologna sandwich yeah, I while would, you're yeah. working that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Multitasking. Well, I need a uh, power plant that produces <laughs> 16.5 megawatts. <laughs> Over an hour. So that's that's a lot. That's So, so you know, the there's you're going to use uh, orders of magnitude more fuel than even a share would use. Yes. But this is actually leading us into what we're what we're trying to talk about today. And it's the way that I win. Because <laughs> you set this up, didn't you? Yes. Well, you, yeah, I, I chose the bagger because I'm going to win. Because, I, you know, you'll have a little hole on the beach, Jason. You yeah. might have a nice trench on the beach. I can basically remove the beach. <laughs> the beach is gone. Yeah. Um, and the, I do want our listeners, go look this thing up, the bagger 293 bucket wheel excavator. We actually had it as the cover art for an episode, a couple episodes ago. Yeah. Uh, really an amazing piece and it's of machinery. Pretty, I mean, they're pretty cheap, right? Like just $100 million or something yeah, like yeah. that? Yeah, it yeah. costs yeah, about $100 million. Well, next cool. year, I'm when we do this next year in season four, I'm going to get the bagger 294. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck with that. Yeah, we'll see... Uh, We'll see how that works out. Yeah, there's actually only one of these in the world. (laughs) But no, the idea that we want to explore is that it's whoever can take in the most energy and create the most power, wield the most power, turn that into useful work that that kind of wins the game these days. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and that's fine if we don't give a shit about like... The consequences, right? Like, who cares if there's a beach left for our kids to play on? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So what we're really talking about here is something called the maximum power principle. And the way that it works, it's a tendency that all living creatures follow and all people, since we're living creatures, most of us anyway. But I want to turn it to our resident biologist to uh, maybe maybe dig a little deeper here. Yeah, maybe... Let's put Jason on the spot. Okay. Yeah. I gotta th- Jason, can you define the maximum power? <laughs> After I sneeze. Okay. <laughs> we'll come to a simple definition, but a little of the history. There was a, a mathematician that got into ecology and sort of helped ecology turn into sort of a more mathematical discipline, uh, Alfred Lotka. So he started developing theories around this and really got popularized a bit by an ecologist, well-known ecologist from the middle of the 20th century named Howard Odom, a descendant of his academically, Charlie Halls talked about this a lot. And actually, Richard Heinberg is going to come out with a book dealing with this topic as well. And we were looking at definitions, and they've all sort of you know rewritten these definitions. But our favorite we found was from a guy named John DeLong, another ecologist, and very succinct and clear. The maximum power principle states that biological systems organize to increase power whenever the system constraints allow. So basically what what he's saying, uh, and you guys correct me if my interpretation is off, but the way I hear that is uh, depending on what's in your environment, you as a creature out there will draw in energy as quickly as you can and turn it into work uh, in an attempt to basically outcompete anybody else that's out there. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not just individuals, it's species, right? And, and yeah, systems. populations, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and so our little uh, digging competition, again, I just want to reemphasize that I'm the winner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I maximized the power. You were, un- in your, in it, theoretically, even though we were on the Oregon beach, it does not have a 16.5 megawatt power plant right, right there. Theoretically, you were still able to do this. <laughs> yeah, we're, again, details. I don't understand why you're so focused on the details. <laughs> I, so actually, I think the last bit there, um, in DeLong's definition, I want to I want to pick on that a little bit. Whenever the system constraints allow, mm-hmm. can we talk about what we mean by by constraints? Like, what, what kind of constraints do we think 
what we're talking about here. Well, this is this is I think the key point to to get into, and that you know we 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 often think about like well oh this is an efficient system or we're trying to optimize for for that or this and really what it what it is is we're making trade off decisions in 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 our work and how we design our work and the equipment we use etc so um so when i pick a shovel i have a very simple tool but it's going to take me quite a long time to do that work so i am I am very low material use. I have a five pound shovel. Um, I'm not using a lot of energy. My energy output's really low. It's just me, but I'm spending time and labor. So I'm I'm very energy and material efficient with my shovel, but I'm I'm pretty labor intensive and time intensive compared to Rob on so, the other end of the spectrum. So those are the four constraints you're mentioning. Yeah. Labor, time, energy, and material. Exactly. I, th- I think you're leaving out a key one. What's that? Intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> We're very constrained in this podcast by intelligence. <laughs> right. But that's a, it is actually interesting what you said if you compare the shovel to the, the, right. the bagger 293 the, the bagger. bucket wheel excavator. <laughs> exactly. Ah, the bagger 293. So that that puppy is minimize the labor and the time obviously. Right. Right. Think about how much fucking sand you can move with that thing, <laughs> yeah. right? In a short period of time. Probably being operated. Well, they probably have a few it, people. It operating takes a it. crew of five. To, okay. I didn't want that again. Details that I didn't want to get into, <laughs> right. but you know, but, I got to uh, bring four. Buddies. A lot of energy, a lot of materials to go into. Right. That, right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the sort of when people say, you know, what are you being? A, what, what's an efficient use? You have to really understand. Okay, are we defining efficiency? What are we defining by labor efficiency? Which this equipment that Rob brought is very labor efficient. The backhoe mm-hmm. is pretty labor efficient. But it's not really energy efficient. In fact, I did some math, your table, I did some additional math on it, and I moved the most sand per unit of energy. Wow. Wow. Yes. That actually, I beat you from efficiency (laughs) on terms of energy. That's not the competition, though, really, was it? I mean, I was. Yeah, right. It was how much sand can you move? How big of a hole can you do? That does remind me, we talked in a previous episode about how the bicycle is the most efficient way that people have invented to get around in, yeah. a, in terms of a calories in and distance traveled. Right. So it's, it's basically the same but thing. The problem, guys, you can't profit from that that much. Uh, this is right? this is very true. So, I mean, this gets to the, the idea of efficiency is that it depends. You, you focus what efficiency you're striving for based on what's abundant and what's scarce. So today... When energy and materials are cheap and abundant and, and easy to get to, we we basically don't give a shit. We'll build a bagger 293. You know? Right. We care about labor and we care about time. Right. 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 And I, I think the, the example I was thinking of with time has to do with transportation. A few years back, I got invited to a conference in England. And of course, being the fuel burning ass that I am, I flew. So, you know, if, I, if you fly from the East Coast of the United States to, to London or, or somewhere in the UK, what does that take? Like six, seven hours, maybe? Yeah, maybe five, six hours. Yeah, five, yeah. six hours. Yeah. Well, compare that to the sailing voyage of Greta Thunberg, where, remember, she was coming over to the U.S. for a, a conference on climate, and she sailed from Plymouth, UK, to New York on a racing yacht. And it only took 15 days, right? So yeah. compare the – which actually feels – that, that was like a racing yacht. Yeah, that's a fast yeah. Uh, yeah. yacht trip across. I, I actually read about it, said there was no toilet on board and no showers. Yeah, those are details, good, details. Good no need to go into these details. <laughs> I was just like, wow, that, that's a bare bone ship. Good for Greta. And, um, it definitely motivated them to go as fast as possible. Right. <laughs> but, I mean, look at, look at the difference there, right? Like here I'm – getting this great time efficiency and she's obviously because she's a good person compared to me <laughs> is getting the energy efficiency which is is what we're talking about yeah. you know we need to start looking at that right and i mean we've talked about this maybe ad nauseum but really a lot of this just comes back to to energy right yeah. for most of our history energy was was scarce it was constrained which means that we you know, had to focus much more of our labor and our time on things. Things yeah. took a lot longer, yeah. took a lot more labor. Well, and this idea of like competing and winning 
it's easy to get in this mindset of, oh, I took the plane and I won because I got there in six hours instead of 15 days. I didn't even get seasick, you know, and, and, and that's where the focus has come. Yeah, and, they, you know, what's interesting is, like, we're kind of making jokes about this a little bit and making these kind of silly examples, but this has real-world consequences, and they're actually ge- geopolitically people think about this in terms of, of power and projecting sure. power, and it actually can come down to literally, right, the – the uh, the quality of the fuels you have and your industrial production and all that's tied to then can you harness energy yeah. so a good example is talked about with historians is World War II where the U S built up like the the hydroelectric dam system during the Great Depression right we yeah. we were putting all these installations along the Columbia River that created this incredible uh, electricity source for Washington the state of Washington and, and parts of Oregon as well which allowed then these manufacturing plants for Boeing to get established and all these aluminum manufacturers. So we were able to churn out ships and airplanes in massive numbers quickly because we had this incredible electricity supply. We also had the most well-developed oil industry in the world. And so we were able to churn out better fuels, higher octane, more reliable supplies to fuel those planes and essentially – therefore fly higher, faster, longer than comp- competing powers in World War II. It made a difference. Yeah, maximum power principle. If you can suck up that energy and get more more resources going, you can out-compete. In, out-compete. in fact, I mean, you, you look at, at wars broadly, but you look at World War II specifically, and a lot of the tactical strategies were really around minimizing access of, of the oh, enemies. Af- to- North Africa. North Africa, right. in, you know, Indonesia, these areas where the Japanese wanted to conquer these areas in order to have access yeah. to these resources. The Caspian was a big area for yeah. that. Yeah. So definitely. But this, this also works, of course, not just in humans, but in other species. So there's really fun examples to think about. You lived in the desert, what, New Mexico, is that right? Yeah, I was in Albuquerque for a few years and actually doing studies of ecosystems, including the the lower Colorado River. So pretty, yeah. pretty big time desert dry down areas yeah so it's interesting to think about like this idea you know what you do you change what you do depending on if resources or environment are scarce and in desert often there's plenty of sand in the desert (laughs) it's not scarce (laughs) at all all the backhoes we want (laughs) right (laughs) well i'm thinking about different strategies for example for the plant so like the cacti right have these columns and they're green and they're succulent but one of my favorite plants is the ocotillo that is an Awesome plant. I, I yeah, I know you know plants way better than I do, but those like those are the ones with the big, long, spindly arms. They get these beautiful red flowers on the end of them. And what happens after a rain? Uh, the flowers come out. <laughs> yeah, but um, also they leaf out. So they they will they have these sort of um, ability to sort of just send out a bunch of leaves when there's water. But when mm-hmm. there's not water, they just they go bye bye. And so again, they're, they're maximizing. The intake of energy when 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 the resources in this same water in case water allow them to do that yeah when right. that constraint temporarily because goes away temporarily goes away now other animals have different stress so like I think of hummingbirds so right now we have a lot of hummingbirds in our in our yard and they aren't here in the winter because it's too cold there there's not nectar resources these things will fly thousands of miles away and migrate and they're always just making sure they're following where there's a lot of plant life and young flowers and insects. Well, they should be really glad that we're warming up the planet then because then they don't have to fly so far. <laughs> yeah, let's hang out. And actually, some, some, some things like that are happening where birds are stopping migration because they're like, yeah, it's warm enough here year-round. It's well, you say you have hummingbirds in the yard, but I think I'm hearing red-winged blackbirds. Yeah. I don't know if our mics are picking that up. But oh, a l- little nice. bonus for today's episode if they yes. are. But you think about like mammals – have this constant demand, and so do hummingbirds, to always be burning em- energy. We're warm blooded, mm-hmm. and so we have to. Mammals either have to, you know, migrate to find food sources. Think of the big migrations on the savanna, you mm-hmm. know, of those animals, or bison, yeah. bison and stuff. Or the beast, come on, will the beast, right? And the Serengeti. But what? What some animals like bears hibernate. So they essentially they say, "This is the winter. I'm going to just." chill out and sleep and not burn much energy, right? 
So they're they're changing their power use yeah. according to when they. I feel like people are somewhere in between. Like I, I feel like I know some people who hibernate, you know, yeah. kind of get shut down during the winter. I, yeah. I wouldn't mind doing that. Do you ever see a find a snake den? No. Oh, those are pretty cool. You'll see like giant piles of snakes like tucked into like these dens and they're just they're doing the same kind of thing they're just keeping they're, themselves warm trying to keep themselves warm and out of the cold yeah. and then they move out into the sun when the when the days uh, when they need to yeah but you know so we're talking about constraints and the reason we're bringing this up is that the constraints of energy and re- in other material resources has been lifted temporarily right. for us humans but this maximum power principle again does not only applied to other species in the sense of like how they figured out how to maximize considering constraints, but other species also have gone crazy when they haven't had constraints. Yes. Right. And maybe my favorite example is one that's often talked about when, when people try to kind of illustrate the concept of overshoot, which we've talked a little bit about before, but I think really applies to the maximum power principle as well. And that is the story of St. Matthew Island. You guys you guys mm. familiar yeah, with that story? Famous eco- ecology story as well. Yeah, so for fo- tell it to me again, Daddy. Yeah, please. It's, a, it's a nice <laughs> bedtime story. Cuddle up, Rob. Get your pillow and your little bear bear, and, and I'll tell you. Yeah. Tell reindeer, you a nice story. right? They land on the roof, and the guy yeah. in the red yeah, suit. Yeah, that's comes that's down the, the one. That's the one I was. Okay, tell kids. You about. Here's what happens where you might die. <laughs> here's what happens to the reindeer when you leave them alone. <laughs> Santa no, goes away. No, it's an amazing story. Please. Yeah. Okay, so. Back in World War II, we were just talking about World War II, the U.S. Coast Guard was really worried about the Japanese attacking the West Coast, right? Mm -hmm. And we set up up and down the West Coast all kinds of, I mean, I think San Francisco had the most sort of, uh, you know, coastal whatever alarm system set up. But they decided that they needed to put some stations, the U.S. Coast Guard want to put some stations, outposts up in Alaska area, Bering Strait. So they set up an outpost on this little island called St. Matthew Island, totally barren island. They set up some guys out there. They they had some food supplies for them. Obviously, it's really, really fucking cold, right? Yeah, and it's yeah. like I, I'm looking at a map of it right now. It's, it looks like it's basically halfway between Alaska and, and Asia. Sarah Palin uh-huh. could see it from her house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but uh, so they had some emergency supplies, but they decided that they actually needed to bring some reindeer as well as backup in case oh, they, go they got iced in. They couldn't, you know, no ships could come in and, and provide. They're going to eat bring... Rudolph and Donner exactly. and Dancer and <laughs> so, Blitzen. So they brought like 29 reindeers, like an emergency food supply for themselves, okay. you know. And of course, this was like in 44. The war ended just, you know, 18 months later or whatever it was, a year later. And they left. And they decided, well, let's just leave the reindeer here. Yeah. They seem, they seem pretty happy. happy, right? They just opened the pen and let them go, huh? Yeah. And there's a biologist who heard the story years later, like, you know, 15 years later, a dozen years later, a guy named David Klein. And he decided he wanted to go see what the impact was on this island. What happened to these reindeer that were left behind? So he went there with an assistant, and he discovered something insane, right? So 29 reindeer have been left there. Guess how many were there just like, you know, 12 years later? Uh, uh, double. No, more than that. Uh, uh, a thousand. Well, how how fast do reindeer breed? Uh, Every this year. Is, that was not in my uh, my biology class. There are thirteen hundred and fifty. I was pretty close. I said a thousand. So about forty six times the original number. Yeah. Right. In a dozen years. Yeah. Okay. And then he came back six years later. After that, you know, he got some extra money or whatever it was. Came back six thousand. Oh. <laughs> so what what were they yeah. eating? They're eating lichen. So they had this situation where there are no predators. Right. No right? wolves. N- nobody eating them. And they had this abundant food source. You know, reindeer apparently like lichen. And there are a lot of, yeah. there's a lot of lichen and there. And you can fit the way that they fly, they could cover all kinds of distance <laughs> totally. all over the yeah. island. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And they weren't being put to work. You know, they were left alone. Right. Santa wasn't bugging them. <laughs> but then, you know, Klein came back three years later. Only three years later. Wow. Went from 6,000 to 42. Ouchie 6, poo. 6,000 to 42. That's a pretty miserable 42. And there was only one male in that population. So um, Luckily, that male had evolved into a carnivore and was eating the other reindeer. Is that right? Is that what happened? Do I have this story? No matter how hard he tried to procreate, you know, the, the tide was against them. And they, they're, you know, by the 80s, they're all gone, right? Wow. 
So again, this is like, you sort know, people like use this. bottoms. By the 80s, they were all gone. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, this is an example that people talk about with overshoot, right? This, this reindeer population had an abundant resource, went cr- kind of crazy, overshot the capacity of, of the ecosystem. They ate all the lichen up because they had no predators to check their population. And then, you know, they went essentially extinct on that island. But it is a good example of the maximum power principle when you re- remove constraints. Yeah. All, all species probably, you know, or very right. many of them, would behave in that way. Yeah, right? they're trying to maximize the intake of lichen and they, in order to reproduce as fast as they can. So that's sort of like the work they're doing, right? The idea is you're converting the energy you intake into something. And that, in this case, is just reproducing. Like, they yeah. don't... They're not worried about shovels or excavators. They're basically just I'm gonna... thinking of these uh, Charlie Sheen reindeer just going, winning! <laughs> <laughs> and it, what's interesting to think about is, like, theoretically, lichen is a renewable resource, right? Yeah. Okay, it grows. But it doesn't grow that fast. Have you ever saw, uh, sat and watched lichen grow? <laughs> it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. it's, it doesn't grow anywhere near as fast as paint dries. I mean. <laughs> right. But no, it, I... It, Obviously, that like you said, Asher, that story has been used as a "Hey, watch out for overshoot." But I, I do think dissecting it a bit in the in the maximum power realm is a good idea because we've, you know, Jason, you were saying before, all living creatures, basically all these self organizing systems, have this tendency. People have it too, which was probably okay when we were in our foraging days. You know, mm-hmm. before we figured out how to make so many wondrous tools and before we figured out how to grab this once in a lifetime lottery major supply of of energy in the form of fossil fuels yeah and it seems like uh you know you could say you could make the argument well humans are a lot smarter than reindeer we're not going to we're not going to do what they did but if you look at how we're behaving it seems like we're right on the reindeer path yeah. here if you kind of equate lichen to fossil fuel, yeah, I mean, we're, we grab that stuff as fast as we can. Even once we've come to this time where we understand the climate impacts of burning so much fossil fuel, we're still... Yeah, still fighting for more pipelines and more tar sands. Oh, I know. Like, like what, Trudeau, the, the Canadian prime minister, it's a riot because he, at one side of his mouth, he seems to be this liberal who cares about climate and believes in it and then the next thing you know it's like pushing through pipeline projects right, right. it's just it's just absurd well, the good thing is it's a lichen pipeline so <laughs> it's it's not nearly as damaging they got so much lichen in canada oh my gosh <laughs> i think there's an interesting paradox here i mean we've talked about sort of evolutionary biology stuff adaptation over time getting benefits it's an evolutionary trait i assume this maximum power principle, right? It made makes sense that so many species have it, but having that in the context of of scarcity or limits of resources, you not only puts that into check, but we have that and a, a scarcity mindset as well hmm. that's sort of built, still built into us, right? right? right. Like these these driving kind of, I don't know, these influences that we're not yeah. even like conscious Instinctual, about. Instinctual yeah, drives. That we kind. think it, we, we've been living in this period of the most material abundance imaginable. Yeah. But we're functioning as though we have the scarcity mindset to it. And at the same time, we're completely checked out on the, on the, the likelihood that we're going to actually hit scarcity. Well, here's what I think crazy. we need to do then. If we're going the way of the reindeer, we need to get your what's your thing called again? My what? Your your shovel? Oh, it's the it's the Bagger 293. We just start we just got to just start digging graves with the Bagger 293 cuz hey. we're going to need them. And, and let's let's just figure out how to do it with 3 people instead of, instead five. of 5. You guys are invited on my bag. We'll get That's more such a morbid picture, <laughs> Jason. Do we really need the Bagger? <laughs> no, we'll just use your backhoe. You're right. I'm okay. sorry. Thank you. Can we okay. just moderate this a Let's little moderate. bit? Okay. Good work, guys.
stay tuned for our George Costanza Memorial Do the Opposite segment, where we discuss things we can do to get the hell out of crazy town. Hey, you don't have to just listen to the three of us blather on anymore. We've actually invited someone intelligent on the program to provide inspiration. Uh, Rob Jason, I wanted to share a review this time from Joanne BF on iTunes. Joanne says, these guys give us climate change activists a look at the state of affairs with enough humor to make it feel like we're all in on the joke. That's well, excellent. That is sweet. First of all, it's great that an activist is listening to this show and getting something out of it. That makes me uh, feel nice and warm. But, you know, the three of us like to have fun together, and it's hard to talk about some of these subjects. You know, you get tired, you get beaten down. So we, we have to make some jokes and try to spread a little cheer as we do it. So I'm, I'm glad that that's resonating with someone out there. That's right. Everybody needs to try to enjoy the day. Thanks for that review, Joanne. And if you like the podcast, please take a a few minutes to just rate us or or give us a review on your favorite podcast app. Every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. (laughs) My life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. Oh, righty here. We are going to do the opposite, huh? So what that means in this context, it's, it's interesting because we've grown up in this culture where we've been optimizing for being labor efficient and time efficient, right? So if you ever run a business, it's like, how do you, how do you reduce the number of workers, right? Yeah. How, do you, how do you get things done faster? And, and I think the opposite then is to think instead of those efficiencies, right, to remind you uh, what we talked about earlier in the show is that there's other things to optimize for, which would be like energy and materials. So it turns out that typically when you substitute human labor with machines, that you end up using more energy and materials, obviously. Yeah. And so the idea- Take your shovel versus- Yeah, the, the bagger. The bagger, exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Though that's the opposite. That's the opposite incentive, you know, a structure we've had, and it's the, the opposite strategy. But anyways, the first thing to do is recognize what you're doing, right? Recognize what's being optimized for and knowing that there's these different things to optimize for, labor, time, energy, materials. I'm, I'm picturing you, Jason, every time somebody says something's efficient, you're like, <laughs> you're very skeptical. <laughs> you're trying to feel efficient at what? Yeah, yeah. What are you With talking what about? resource are we talking about? What's uh-huh. the constraint here? Yes, exactly. But, <laughs> but, you know, human societies have made these calculations, whether they're conscious about it or not, depending upon the kind of the constraints that they had. So, you know, I was thinking about the pyramids, the pharaohs. Aliens made those, right? Right. <laughs> right. Very no, efficient for were, us. They were made by reindeer. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so they, they were made by my people. Oh, way good. back when. Oh, congratulations. Um, who are your people? The Jews. Okay. There were lots of <laughs> slaves that, that, that were involved. But, you know, for them, I think the Pharaoh's motivation was, you got to get this fucking thing built pretty quickly. And by pretty quickly in their context, it wasn't like six weeks. It was 10, 20 years or right. whatever it was before the Pharaoh dies so you can get buried in there. and you know. Oh, that's their eternal laugh to hide. Yeah, that's where so, the, uh, the aliens then pick you up at the top of the pyramid. Can you just stop <laughs> with the alien stuff? So they... For them, actually, time was was something that they were trying to maximize for yeah, on a yeah. certain level. So they churned through labor like nobody's business. Oh, they, if you're a, if you're a slave building a pyramid, you're not going to last that long. Oh, the right. hernia rate was incredible <laughs> among those slaves. But they didn't they didn't, they, care. they didn't care about that, right? right. Whereas you you contrast that Wait. to the you know we talked about cathedral building, uh-huh. cathedral thinking before yeah. they were building these things over centuries. You know, so in a sense. Time was the thing that they were not optimizing. But they for, wanted to right? have craftsmanship, right? Right. Yeah. So they were willing to hire people like good wages and all these guilds that formed and you had yeah. to make sure you knew what you're doing because these arches had to be perfect. And, and they the probably carving. were con- they yeah. were constrained by energy. And money. And they're constrained by labor on some level. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I mean these are calculations that, that society's made. Now we're not thinking about it at all, other than thinking about like two options, like time and labor, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, nothing's really thought of when it comes to energy, right? Because it's just, like we said, it's, uh, it's always been there. Yeah. So, so what, what is doing the opposite then? We start, uh, start working towards being efficient with, with energy and materials, right? Yeah. 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 Well, how are we going to do that? And it's hard <laughs> because right now they're cheap and abundant, right? So it's, 
That's why we call it do the opposite. Well, we have to <laughs> we have to limit ourselves. Yeah, because I, mean, I think what we're saying it's not going to happen with the economic system that we have in place. Well, um, he, here's here's the rub, right? Where we will it will be it'll happen. It will happen to us, or we could do it to ourselves. If we do it to ourselves on some level, we might be able to you know actually have future humans living on this planet. If we don't. Uh, and we'll have other species to enjoy this planet with. If yeah, it's we don't very, do that. Yeah, yeah. then it's dig dig a backhoe, use a backhoe, and dig the graves. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I <laughs> but anyway, what you, this reminds me of the Amish. What you're saying, a culture, right? They actually do limit themselves. That says, "I'm going to limit the technology, the tools I choose. Right. The tools they choose are tools that actually limit their power. Right? And that's yep. interesting. They're they're deciding, okay, I'm going to use horses, and I'm not going to use these machines." Right. that put the fossil fuels in, right? So I think, yeah, choosing your tools yeah. and deciding what, what you're going to do with them and how much power you're going to wield. Now, I, I understand they're able to do this because they're a tight-knit community and have a, a lot of religious ideals, values that they're trying to follow. Do either of you have any idea why they came up with that point, that they're, you know, the tool set? Like, we're going to limit it right here? No, I don't remember. No, I do don't know, but... I think what's important here, and I think there's trade-offs with this, is this, it's not just a collection of individuals who are like, hey, we're all going to band together and kind of agree on these limits. They strongly reinforce with social norms that I think are, can come with some real you know, restriction on people's yeah. f- you know, freedom, individuality, these kinds of things. And, and that gets to the fact that it's not just an individual making a choice, it's these reinforcing cultural norms and expectations and probably laws and right. and societies that that create the conditions to restrict well, that's, these things. Well, that's why I wish we had things like like rationing of energy, right? right. And and I think it's really important for for those of us who are thinking about like climate, for example, and, and limiting carbon. Whether you want to have a carbon tax or not have a carbon tax or what is the price you want to put a carbon or not, if we don't have a cap on it, an actual yeah, cap on it, right. I'm very skeptical and concerned about our ability to limit ourselves the way that we need to. Until the constraints bite and we go, right, we go which is, reindeer. In a sense, too late. It's too you know, late. It, maybe it's not that too late, but, <laughs> okay, right, but right. still very painful, very difficult. Right. right. So clearly we need to be working – on policies that limit our our use of energy uptake or, or limit our energy uptake and limit our, our ability to wield power. And creating social norms and cultural... Right. You know. So this whole system change, yeah. but uh, that's all well and good, and, and uh, but we don't have to wait for that either. I think we also need to look in, in our own households and in our own individual behavior, uh, what is it that we can do that... that goes along those lines. We gave the example earlier how Greta took the the sailboat across the Atlantic. You know, she she clearly made this trade-off, one of those choice trade-offs, time versus uh, energy expenditure. Yeah. And you've, we talked about how, how amazing bicycles are, right? Yeah. And they take a little more time. It takes about twice as long to bike into town as it does to drive, you yeah. know? So it's not... Not that I think the, the hard part there, again, you're still fighting some cultural norms, right? Like, oh, you have to be at your job at this time, and you got to be over here to pick up the kids yes. from school at that time. And it, right. It's a chain error. I'm yeah. not saying that you, you couldn't do it by bike. It's really about finding ways to get the job done without having to maximize power. Well, and so, I mean, be really this, creative. This yeah. is why I basically have just stopped using my body for anything. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't exercise at all. I don't yeah. lift anything more than, I, I think, one, one and a half pounds, uh-huh. something like that. So, okay. you know, I've, I've created conditions where basically I have no power. You, you actually stay in the cockpit of your backhoe and use that for all, all tasks. <laughs> Is this your excuse at home when, uh, when Kirsten exactly asks right. you to do chores? Yeah. Can't oh. do it. I am, I am trying to minimize my... My uh, my power. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're very not powerful. <laughs> Richard Heinberg is a senior fellow here at the Post Carbon Institute, so he's one of our gang members. 
He is one of the world's foremost experts on the history of fossil fuels and a respected advocate for the shift to a renewable energy economy, which includes a strong case for the limits to growth. More importantly, he's written tons of stuff, spoken at events all over the world, and appeared in dozens of media productions. And his most recent book, with a publication date of September 2021, is Power, Limits and Prospects for Human Survival. But I'd also like to say what I think Richard is really best at is breaking down complex and nuanced topics and explaining them with logic and insight so that anyone can understand it. He's really a natural-born teacher, and I'm happy to count him as a friend and colleague here at Post Carbon. Richard, welcome to Crazy Town. Hey, Rob. (laughs) Good to be in Crazy Town with you. Thank you. Well, yeah, yeah, maybe to some extent, right? (laughs) Okay, I got a lot of questions for you. Jason, Asher, and I have been engaged in a conversation about the maximum power principle as one of the hidden drivers that has pushed humanity into the sustainability crisis. I know you've spent a lot of time considering physical and social power while you've been working on your book, Power. So first off, I'm curious if there was a topic that surprised you or especially stood out as you dove into your research on the book. Yeah, well, I think what stood out to me was just the immense variety in the expression of power. On a pound-for-pound basis, life is actually far more powerful than the sun. And that I know that seems incredible, but the sun is very massive. And if you divide its mass by its luminosity and then compare that with the rate of energy transfer in the average cell, the cell wins every time. Life is just amazingly powerful. And from the very first living cell right up to the present, life and evolution have been all about gathering and using energy to do things. And what an amazing variety of things living beings have learned to do. Moving, sensing, thinking, reproducing, communicating, fighting, cooperating, the list goes on and on. And it's not just all about survival and reproduction. It's also about beauty. Animals that reproduce through sex have found ways of attracting mates. And uh, and flowering plants that have to be pollinated have learned amazing ways to attract pollinators. Now, for animals, the production of beauty often becomes an obsession in and of itself, apart from its value in sexual selection. And the result is that nature is just incredibly beautiful. And it's not just an inadvertent byproduct of everything else they're doing. And I'm not talking about beauty just in terms of human subjective impressions. No, what what I discovered is that nature is intentionally beautiful. It works hard at it. And again, all of this is the result of the workings of power. Wow, that's uh, that's actually kind of inspiring, right? That nature, we can like sleep better at night knowing that nature is working hard at being beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I appreciate that that insight. And I'm one of the lucky people who has gotten a chance to read your book ahead of publication. And it's got the usual amount of clarity and organization and excellent writing that you're known for. But what, what I really appreciated about it was the, the depth of analysis. It's my sense that this book took you on a different sort of journey, maybe, than previous writing experiences. And I want to know if, if my sense is correct there. Or, or in other words, could you describe what the process of, of researching and writing this book has meant to you? Well, I've always been kind of a, a big picture guy. And my MO is is mostly to uh, synthesize other people's work. Of course, I aim for the best, the latest thinking about the most important questions. And there's a lot of that in this book as well. I ended up reading literally dozens of books and, and lots more technical articles as I was preparing to write this book. 
And it turned out to be an opportunity to brush up on the latest findings and, and thinking in fields from cell biology to anthropology to communications theory to game theory. And it was, it was pretty exhilarating. A lot has changed in these fields in just the last few years. But at the same time, on this occasion, I, I feel I may also have made an original contribution. The word power certainly gets used a lot, but to my knowledge, nobody has tried to tie together power's many um, meanings and manifestations in the world and to look for links and commonalities and, and general rules. I found myself having to define power rather carefully, depending on the context. And then I had to reflect on what I thought I had found and look for exceptions and see if this was really true. Of course, that's just critical thinking, nothing new there. But it was exciting to be in somewhat unexplored territory and with a responsibility for mapping it properly for others who might follow. <laughs> While you were describing that, Richard, I was glad to hear that you're the one taking on that responsibility I can't think of anyone any more well qualified. <laughs> in fact, uh, I was thinking if I were in that position, I might just have to quit writing. But uh, <laughs> we, we well know that, that you didn't do that. So thank you. I can't help myself. I probably should, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the main points that you make or, or a big case that you make in the book is that we humans have to control our thirst for power. And you also claim that we have the capacity to do that. And you go on to recommend a new principle that you call the optimum power principle. I was hoping you could describe what you mean by that and how it might interact with the maximum power principle. And then how you see the quest to limit power playing out. Right. Well, the optimum power principle is is not a, an alternative to the maximum power principle. It's more an addition to it. And in a way, it's nothing new. Everybody knows that life is full of checks and balances, whether it's homeostasis within organisms and systems and cells, or predator-prey relationships in ecosystems. In human societies, there are always ways of at least partially preventing the accumulation of too much political or economic power. Like in modern societies, we've, we have environmental regulations to keep us from overrunning nature and redistributive programs to keep economic inequality from growing to catastrophic extremes. Of course, these measures aren't always sufficient either in nature or human society. That's why societies sometimes collapse. My book makes the argument that our current efforts to limit and share power are falling way behind where they would need to be in order to avert a crisis. But to my knowledge, no one has given this general phenomenon a name before, this, this tendency of living systems to find ways to limit or balance power. And actually, Rob, the specific term came from you in a conversation we were having early on about the book. Wow. Anyway, once we have a name for something, it sometimes becomes easier to see it and to recognize it. Just last week, I heard a, a podcast about the discovery of a protein within cells called mTOR. And this, this protein senses when there's sufficient food and space for the organism to expand. If there is, the protein triggers growth. If there isn't, it instructs the cell or the organism to shut down growth and instead engage in repair activities. So there's the optimum power principle at work at the cellular level. It's everywhere, really. Wow. I had forgotten the conversation we had, so uh, I'm happy to steal some credit, but, uh, but I don't stealing. think I really deserve any there. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh well that's that's really amazing and an interesting idea that if you look around you can find it in places the optimum power principle where you weren't necessarily expecting it like this this mTOR protein that you're talking about. So I'm wondering then if like you said that some some parts of society have have struggled with with dealing with 
kind of keeping their power in check, and maybe they would even tend toward collapse. I'm wondering if you could give us some good examples of how an individual or a community of individuals could go against that sort of a tide when it comes to their relationship with power. So the question is really, how can we limit our power as individuals, not continually expand it, while also trying to live the good life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I guess you could say that indigenous peoples, and especially hunter-gatherers, were the original power geniuses. They eliminated bullies through ostracism, or if necessary, by executing them. They made all their important decisions by consensus. And authority within their societies was always situational, depending on who had the relevant skills and experience. Men had their areas of special ability, and women had theirs. Of course, it wasn't paradise, and and groups sometimes fought each other over foraging territory. But when you look back, just about everything that we try to do in modern civilization to keep economic and political power within bounds can be seen as a way of trying to somehow approximate or recover the the balance and the freedoms that we enjoyed back then. But of course, now we have vast power in the form of fossil fuels, and that's really upset our relations with, with nature and with one another. Somehow, we've got to limit that power, or the whole human enterprise goes bust. Of course, collectively, our challenge is to zero out our carbon emissions. But this is ultimately going to require behavior change. I've always advocated like day-long or week-long energy fasts as a way of coming to understand just how dependent we are personally on these relatively new energy sources and how freeing it is to, to unplug. That makes it easier to come to grips with the kinds of collective restraints we'll need in order to minimize the threat of climate change. Maybe we can think of similar sorts of exercises to help ourselves think more creatively about species extinctions and resource depletion, pollution, and economic inequality. Moderation and reciprocity have to start somewhere, and the best place is in our own lives, in our own households, our communities, It's a matter of noticing how much power you have that's actually contributing to environmental destruction and inequality and how you take it for granted. And then of finding other ways of sharing and using power that are less harmful and that actually make you feel empowered by doing something, even if it's as simple as sharing with your neighbors or going for a walk or paying attention to nature. So it's as much about finding new forms of power as it is about giving up power altogether. Well, you always have a way of helping me and people that read your works uh, see the world differently. And Mm. I I really appreciate that about you. Uh, Richard Heinberg is the author of Power, Limits and Prospects for Human Survival, set for publication in September of 2021. You can find out more about that at postcarbon.org. Thanks so much, Richard, for visiting Crazy Town. Hey, it's always a pleasure, Rob. Good talking with you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Crazy Town. Yeah, if by some miracle you actually got something out of it, please take a minute and give us a positive rating or leave a review at your preferred podcast app. And thanks to all our listeners, supporters, and volunteers. And special thanks to our producer, Melody Travers. Hey guys, I'm I'm thinking I might have to take a little respite from the show. What? Um, not right away. I, I have to plan this out carefully, but it's it's actually something I learned about one of our sponsors. Oh, um, it's called the Power Down Bar. Oh, was it was it invented by Richard Heinberg? 
it's it's <laughs> it's uh, it it was sort of inspired. He inspired the inventors oh, okay. of this, but also they were inspired by the notions of the maximum power principle and the need to sort of work with our environment. So I'm thinking over the winter, I'm going to take one of these. What it does, you eat one and you won't wake up for about five months. <laughs> So I might do like three quarters of one. How many calories are in this fucking thing? Well, not many calories. In fact, there's actually a problem in that you should put on a lot of extra weight before you eat one of these because you're going to lose <laughs> okay. 40 to 80 pounds. Um, in hibernation. In hibernation. It's, right. I'm glad, Jason, that you have such good relations with our sponsors because you're the one who's going to take the put you down for five months. So this is a bar that bar. basically has this massive shot of like heroin in it or something. Like it just... I, it, the, the, it's a proprietary ingredient. Oh, we list. don't know what it I is. I don't even know, but it's it's been approved. Okay, so you know it's is totally legal, totally on the up and up. Totally you, legal. Um, okay. <laughs> and uh, hey, you know it's really cuts down on laundry. You save money on. So you can cancel all your subscriptions. You need services. somebody to come in every once in a while and turn you over so you don't yes. get these bed sores. Well, right? there is that additional cost. So um, and a catheter to put in. <laughs> Sorry, I don't yeah, mean to... Okay, now that we've details. gotten there, can we just say happy hibernation and yes. be on our way? Clear your calendars, eat a power down bar, folks. Crazy town, da 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 da